Right. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming again. Alfie and uh, Kayleen. Uh, Kayleen. Kayleen, thank you so much. It's hard. I know I just added you to our distribution list, so thank you so much for coming. You bet. So today is July 28th. This is our last of the six meetings that we'd scheduled. Um, and so one of the things we're looking for tonight is at the end of the meeting, if we feel like we're comfortable moving this on to a city council work session. So that's really the next step. Um, I'm going to go over a couple things here before we get started with our overview of the code compliance. And so really the focus of tonight's session was about compliance. Really almost every discussion we've had at these meetings, we always get into compliance. And so we did, decided to dedicate a whole evening to that. Um, before we get into that, though, we're going to kind of go over what what we've covered so far. I do have one proposed edit. And I'll give some background on that. Uh, we'll do it and welcome and introductions first. So at first, I want to acknowledge uh, everything that's going on in Flagstaff, right? Um, we've got a lot of flooding going on. We've got, I think at this point, four burn scars that are impacting huge parts of our community. Neighborhoods that we've talked about a lot at these meetings are being impacted, Sunnyside, south side um, and so at first i just wanted to acknowledge that uh, everybody's going through some really hard times we've got a lot of people working on this and uh, i know it's impacted some of our participation tonight but uh, i just want to acknowledge that so hopefully everybody is staying safe and staying dry so let's do some introductions i'm dan folk i'm the community development director for the city flag staff why don't we go to our guests here next Kayleen Sober. Uh, I've served on Planning and Zoning Commission, and um, I'm part of the Art Signal Box project. Thank you for being here, Kayleen. Duffy Westheimer, citizen. <laughs> and I'm a citizen too. Citizen at large. Citizen <laughs> at large. Thank you, Duffy. Bicyclist is uh, Reggie Eccleston, Code Compliance Manager. Mark Crevas, Heritage Preservation Officer, Neighborhood Planner, back here by the computer. So then let's go to our online folks. I know Stephen is on. Go ahead, Hi, Steve. good evening, everyone. Uh, Stephen Thompson, I'm the volunteer and event coordinator with the Flagstaff Sustainability Office. Laura? I'm Laura Myers with La Plaza Vieja Neighborhood. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to see if I can get the second speaker to work here. Can you say something, Stephen? Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Oh, fantastic. I think we'll just leave it. Does that work for everybody? All right. So again, we've got these ground rules. I think we're all familiar with them. They're on the agenda. I'm not going to read them out loud for everybody. I don't think we've had any issues with ground rules. We've had very productive, respectful meetings. I appreciate that. And so I did email out uh, with the packet, the latest purpose and intent, the actual property care standards, and then the appendix. And I have a little bit of housekeeping and one change that I want to introduce to the group tonight. Um, so back in June, I had gotten a communication from Abel Estrella, who's been very active. Abel's not, he's not here tonight. Uh, he's got some other commitments. But he had emailed me back in June on the 24th some proposed changes to the purpose statement. And we've talked about this a little bit, but I did not present it to the group, and I apologize for that. And so the handout I brought tonight does have a, a proposed edit um, in track changes, and it's really... It's something that Abel had suggested. So I'll just read that to the group. It's the purpose of the property care ordinance is to improve and maintain the appearance of neighborhoods by protecting public health, safety, and welfare through the establishment of minimum exterior maintenance standards for all residential and non-residential buildings, structures, and property, and vacant land in the city to protect against hazardous, deteriorating, and other dangerous conditions. And so the edit is an inclusion at the first sentence of improve and maintain the appearance of neighborhoods. 
And we've gone kind of back and forth on that because we're really we ended up focusing on public health and safety. You know, we talked about broadening the purpose to try to address gentrification, to encourage historic preservation. There's all these wonderful reasons to do property maintenance. We ended up back focusing on health and safety. And we've had this comment a few times about just having kind of a general statement about why else do we want this? And so to improve and maintain the appearance of neighborhoods. And I'm okay with this being in the purpose statement. I think the staff discussion has been, it's hard to define, improve appearance. But again, this is the purpose statement. This is not what we're going to use for enforcement, right? It's the actual standards that get used for enforcement. And so I think in the purpose statement, it's okay to have some kind of language that isn't necessarily defined. And so I've never disagreed. I don't think anyone's disagreed with including this in terms of that's a goal, right? To improve and maintain the appearance of neighborhoods. It's just that we were we got kind of focused on really condensing it. And so uh, I'm going to recommend we include this edit. I know we have a small group here tonight, but I am interested in getting some input. And in, and I know those of you at, uh, joining us on Teams don't have this in front of you, but um, I'll just open it up for comment or questions. Any thoughts on that? Concerns, Stuffy? And based on things Abel has said, I would think that including quality of life for all is appropriate because okay. that is a health and safety. It's not just how it looks and because Rick Lopez was all concerned about the paint coming after people for paint problems. Um, and that's apparent, but I think it's also about quality of life. So you're saying improve and maintain the appearance of neighborhoods and quality of life? Yeah. By protecting? Mm-hmm. Because appearance is subjective. Well, and that's why we've kind of gotten away from it, but again, I think this kind of soft language is okay in the purpose. Because really, you know, the, the, the enforcement, the compliance comes from the, the actual standards. So and I like quality of life as well. It's just we've kind of gone like this right on these. So I'm okay kind of this feels like we're getting right back to the middle, which I'm good with. So I think that's a good addition as well. Robert Wallace just with open space uh, just joined us as well so welcome robert i'd invited robert do you want to introduce yourself robert thank you oh sure yeah i'm robert wallace i work for the open space program um we manage about three thousand acres of open space and we definitely have some invasive weed problems and we'd love to see something in that property care ordinance kind of addressing some of the uh, issues throughout the city thanks yeah thank you robert any other comments on those two edits in the purpose? The next step really is to take this to a council work session, so we'll continue to work on these things, right? All, all the way up until the ordinance is adopted. The intent is the same that we presented, I think, last uh, two weeks ago. I'm not going to read that verbatim. And then we've got the property care standards. Uh, and so this is the next handout that we've got. We've not made any changes to this from the last meeting. And again, I just want to give us one more chance here before we get into potentially going to a public meeting, a, a council work session. You know, our approach was to identify under the property standard. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six bullets that talk about, you know, what are the priorities of property? standard and what does this mean and then we're referring to existing enforcement tools right so rather than consolidating and trying to rewrite all these things we decided let's clearly identify what the goal is so number one provide adequate capacity for refuse and recycling containers providing additional capacity is required to protect health and safety and then rather than writing all these new standards we're referring people to our existing codes on littering solid waste collection fencing and screening standards, because that, that was something that comes up with dumpsters. And so we're just continuing that throughout the document, dealing with the accumulation of debris and harboring pests. So again, referring to littering, solid waste, the fire code, landscaping standards, inoperable equipment, vehicles, appliances that have been abandoned. Again, we go to abandoned vehicles, littering, general parking, deals with uh, repaired vehicles and some other things we've talked about. Eliminate hazards on property and encroaching hazards that impact health and safety. We get into trees and shrubbery, which is landscaping, prohibition of use in right of way, 
and then some more on landscaping. And then we added this on invasive and exotic plant species. And so working with Robert, he's given me sections of the code that deal with this. And so we're going to insert that. Um, there'll be a reference here to where we deal with invasive and exotic species in our city code. Question about that, if I may. Mm -hmm. Exotic plant species, meaning non-natives. You're going to shut down Warners and Viola and all these landscaping companies where people want to put pretty things in their yards. I don't think that's what we're talking about, but I'm going to have to and defer to Robert. Good. Robert, did you hear that question I from Duffy? I think does tend to lead people to believe. Uh, so it might need to clarification is my point. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Um, uh, when I when we talk about invasive uh, noxious weeds, we're talking about uh, scotch thistle, uh, diffuse knapweed, bull thistle, things things of that nature that tend to spread and take over and create monocultures in our in our forest. Yeah. So it's it's not non-native, yeah. But doesn't the word exotic? That's probably an inappropriate word. Yeah, yeah. So. it needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. What's the best terminology here, Robert? Invasive and is it just invasive I, weeds or? I think invasive and, and noxious are probably the two words that the state uses on their invasive species list. And that's what I meant yeah. to write was invasive and noxious weeds. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah. Because. Yeah, uh, Jesse Domingos just came online. Great. Jesse, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi, Jesse. That's a really good catch, though. Thank you. I meant not to squeeze. Another one that I. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead, Duffy. Well, um, it's something that seems to be missing, and it sort of speaks to what Gaylene was talking about, where people hide and people are not pests. So it doesn't really talk about places where people, like when they hide behind the dumpster or behind the bushes at the library or whatever. I turned that down. I'm sorry. It never <laughs> rings. Um, so I think that's kind of missing is that situations that attract people who don't belong there. But they're not pests. Pests are vermin and, you know, yeah. people are different. I'm not sure if that's really a property maintenance issue or a trespassing issue. That's, I, I would think say that's more trespassing, trespassing and PD issue. But isn't that um, an attractive nuisance? Well, lots of things to I mean, a our, car, a shrub, a My experience with the police department on some occasions with schizophrenics like trying to set up housekeeping in our courtyard at the church is that they, for us to be able to um, have them remove these people, that we have to have proper, they uh, put up right, trespassing right. signs. And of course, a church, it's all welcoming to all. It's not going to put up orange trespassing signs every five feet all the way around it. You might as well get razor wire. So, so it's, you know, it's just call and let us and we'll come and we'll talk to them and we'll encourage them to leave kind of thing. And we have this new response team. Is it the care response team? I have heard wonderful things. So about they really, that. it's a more appropriate response than law enforcement. Yeah. And they have folks who can help whatever service yeah. they may need or let's say a pro it's a property that's vacant and no one's taking care of it and it's overgrown with weeds well those are the People ones are that camping could out provide there. proper you know no trespassing and private so the, property the line, enforcement they, they could you know, arrange their pv <laughs> to where they could go and remove them could a neighbor request that if no one's living there yeah. and the owners are not residents the compliance would still yeah. come under trespassing. It's really up to the property owner yeah. if they want the person to allow them or not. And that's in the appendices. Yeah. When we get to that. Okay. Yeah. I just was thinking something's missing here. For I mean, one of the things we did not take on and we talked about it was, you know, do we want a rule that weeds over 10 inches need to be trimmed? We don't have that rule. Um, some natural plants, right? Or we have native grasses and things. We talked about it off and on. 
something I realized the other day driving around town, and I think this is important, and I would say this to city council is, you know, anything we adopt for our citizens, the city needs to be willing to comply with. So when you drive around this community, it is not a community of manicured lawns, right? And this time of year, all along our rights of way, you see lots of growth and this is what happens. And so if we're going to impose this on our citizens, I think the city needs to be prepared to impose it on themselves. So we've not gone there with this. The whole 10 inches, you have to cut it down. Um, you know, things that become a hazard are, is a little different. Trying to make a left turn when you can't see around the bush. <laughs> right. And so, Reggie, they work very hard on keeping overgrowth off of sidewalks, mm -hmm. line of sighted intersections, right? And so there is this line of sight. So as people back out or make a turn, if there's things obstructing views, we can deal with some of that. Um, but just kind of a carte blanche, you know, some property maintenance ordinances you see, like anything over 10 inches has to be trimmed down, right? We've not gone there. We don't have it today, and we have just haven't gone there. Um, based on kind of the, where these discussions have gone. But it's going to be, a point, I think it'll be a discussion point when we get to city council. Yeah, I just thought that, you know, it's, that's happening. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if you wanted to mention it. Again, I don't know if this, um, I think it's a trespassing issue, the idea of people on property. The next section focuses on buildings and structures, right? So here's where we get into vacant buildings, abandoned buildings. We're going to refer to our uh, building code on dangerous buildings. We have a whole section on nuisances, which is again abandoned and dangerous buildings, graffiti abatement. Security for buildings and structures that prevent unauthorized entry. So again, this is we get buildings that are abandoned and they become an attractive nuisance. You know, we contact the owner. They're required to secure the building per the building code. Again, I feel like we have good language on this. Remedies to deterioration of building or structure that threatens the longevity and impacts the health and safety. So again, we're going to get to the International Building Code and, um, you know, this idea of, you know, are we going to regulate peeling paint? You know, I would say we don't have a rule and this is not going to create a rule that says we can write you a ticket for peeling paint, but I think we get to the appendix and this is where this is the community. This is the discussion we've had, right? And so this is a situation where if you've got a property that really needs help and somebody's living in it, and they just don't have the resources, right? This is when we start looking at our program and do we have resources to help this owner paint their house, make repairs? What can we do to help this owner uh, preserve this home and improve it without us being uh, writing a ticket and taking them in front of a judge, right? Nobody in this group that we've had really was in favor of that approach, and so. Again, we're going to focus on health and safety with the appendix that says, you know, if your home is in need of care, we will we're going to try to put you in touch with resources to help you repair that home. And then language on uh, trespassing. This is for it's really up to the property owner if they want to post a no trespassing sign. We were asked to put in language on exemptions. So particularly in a situation like right now where neighborhoods are dealing with natural disasters, the sole discretion of the city to suspend enforcement due to circumstances beyond the property owner's control, community events, natural disasters, fires, flooding. Again, the fear that we're going to use this as a kind of a weapon on people. Um, it's been something we've heard a lot about. Any other comments on that before we go to the appendix real quickly? Is there was something about the city helping with costs. Last time we talked about income producing properties versus owner occupied and if our city revenue should be or resources should be spent on apartment buildings where they right. get a lot of income so if we do get funding for a program it'd be a grant program we'd have to set up parameters for that who's eligible oh, okay um, what's the amount do they need a match that's all the company so if we get a funding source through the budget process to help homeowners, then we have to set up stand guidelines for who can apply. Should it be income qualification? I think the discussion has been about single family owners, right? Maybe not income producing properties, right? Well, there could be someone of low income and who has a rental and they yep. need that income and they can't feed it back in. Yep. But so we'll have to we'll have to work on that. Should we get the, the funding? Do we have any questions from our teams group? Anybody? 
want to comment here? No, I'm good. You want to go over the appendix, Mark? Um, and then we're going to segue into Reggie. Just a brief overview to walk people through it. So the appendix is really intended to be a uh, kind of guiding principles, right? For mitigating these, these situations. This is, of course, me as a building hugger, wanting to make sure these buildings survive and have a new life. So this is recommendations for securing buildings and structures. And the main statement is repair, secure, remove, and properly dispose of deteriorating material, deteriorated materials, which indicate an appearance of abandonment visible from street frontage. When things start accumulating, you know the building is vacant and it does attract issues, some fairly major issues. So remove litter, door hangers, mail accumulates at the building, repair broken, loose, damaged building components, you know, such as screen doors, shutters, graffiti should be removed. Uh, they shall have secured locks, secure windows, uh, then I talk about uh, property owners may decide to fully secure a building. There's recommendations for how to properly secure a building. So no trespassing signs. There's ways to secure doors and windows correctly. Um, also, I truly believe if you think about selling the building or taking it on to another time and repairing it later, that the panel should fit the opening they should have an improved appearance. They should be secured. So that's recommendations on how to properly quote. A lot of people talk about it being mothballing a building. So uh, recommending uh, preventing a building and structure deterioration uh, provide remedies. That allows for the continued safe future, healthy habitation, repair, secure, replace, and properly dispose of material, uh, deteriorated materials. So we talked about roof, siding, trim, windows, and paint. So again, we've been talking about peeling paint, but those type of protective surfaces, if they're not there, lead to deterioration and the loss of a building. So there's a talking about posting and, and security. Um, there should be identifiable boundaries, you know, if you have like a problem area, if it's vacant land, if it's a building, you know, you're posting no trespassing, like you said, police don't show up or can do anything unless you've properly posted. So you can't just believe that people won't trespass. So they are responsible for, there's a lot of liability there for allowing properties to be broken into. So. Those are suggestions that can be handed out in this whole effort on how to properly do something. Duffy? What does it mean when you say from street frontage? Like what if someone's on a corner? That's no frontage. I it's no frontage? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I was wondering if like where the address is only. Yeah. No. But it's like, well. <laughs> Segway. You're, you're the code guy. <laughs> I'll say great to you. Do you want to see? Just let's see if there's any questions on yeah. the appendix from our um, team group. I didn't read it to great extent, but that is information that was sent out. So if there's any real edits or you know the English language sometimes escapes me, you know, make those recommendations. I haven't seen anything from our oh. uh, teams groups. So I think it. This is a good time to turn it over to Reggie to talk about compliance. Yep, stand up in front of the camera. Uh, that would be preferred, yes. <laughs> you're not on camera there. Stand on the side. Now everybody knows what you're talking about. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank, thanks, everyone, for being here this evening on Teams as well as here in person. Uh, again, my name is Reggie Eccleston. I'm the code compliance manager uh, for the city. Uh, we, my department and my staff, we basically are the ones with that entity that make sure all city codes are followed and complied with. 
we've got a whole lot of different titles, so we can't be experts as far as having that knowledge in our heads, but we always know where to go find it. Um, it is a difficult task at times because sometimes the codes are very gray. Um, they can be subject to interpretation. We do the best we can. When we're not sure, we go to smarter people like Dan and Mark and our <laughs> attorneys and people like that. And so uh, it, it is a very difficult job, but we try to make it as fun as possible. One of the things um, that I've brought to, to the department is I am very community oriented. And so I'm always trying to work with the community as opposed to punishing people. I think I've had a lot more success with that approach as opposed to just being heavy handed. Um, that's the approach we'll continue to take with this property care ordinance if it does go through. Um, as you can see, there are codes that are currently on the books that we can still utilize even if for some reason the property care ordinance doesn't go through. I think the property care ordinance is one of those tools that we can develop the program to be able to help people in a better fashion as well. I know from my experience when we're dealing with a lot of uh, properties that overgrown, cluttered, that type of thing. I have found that it's best to have a way to get the people to comply with us by incentivizing, offering some assistance. Um, most of the properties that in the property care ordinance that we are are targeting and talking about are those those properties that are full of things, stuff valuables to a person, but it may, may not look valuable to us. And so that's the thing that we have to be very careful and cognizant of, that we are not uh, minimizing what's important to someone else. Um, we do have the codes, things that are clear uh, as far as litter and trash and things like that. We can clearly find that in the code right. and have a way to address it. And how you doing? And and so what we do is um, again we just try to be as open and compassionate enough to find a way for people to want to do something. And and I've had a lot of success doing it that way. Uh, um, the few times I've had to go to court, we we won but then nothing gets done because people can't afford it. Now we've already added uh another expense to them by court fees which we wanted them to comply and those court fees now took away from their ability to do a cleanup and so ultimately it still comes back to us so with this property care ordinance if we can really develop this and turn it into a program and we can find ways the council has a way to allocate more money for us we can target certain properties throughout the years couple of years where we can actually incentivize if they're not able to pay themselves, we can assist in that. I've done that numerous times, even without the property care ordinance, where we provided a roll off dumpster because we know that's an expense. Um, if, if we've been able to get bodies, elderly people can't get out there and clean it exactly. themselves. Those are most of the properties that are like that, believe it or not. The ones yeah. with a lot of clutter It's because a lot of the elderly their families aren't around. They're not coming up on a regular basis to visit. We do try to contact them to see if they can offer some assistance, but there are many times where it's no one but them. And then we come in and if we were to be heavy handed and punish them, take them to court, it's, it's just defeating purpose. And so I think this is the type of thing, if we can get it passed, if we can actually get it implemented, I think it would be a good way for as our priority based budgeting, we can use this as a priority for the community. And if we can do that, I feel like we can get allocated some more money and we could do a much, much better job um, than what's happened in the past. So um, with that said, a little bit about how our process works, co-compliance. Once we're made aware of a property that may be in violation, we go out and investigate. Got a very small staff. It's it's basically I, I have two code compliance officers and a dark sky specialist. So I say we have three and a half people because I call myself a half because I have to do a lot of office work too. 
So I'm not in the field as much as I would like to be, um, but there's four of us total. Um, we have the whole city that we have to patrol. Um, so we can't see everything. That's when we count on the citizens and the community to report to us things that we don't see ourselves. We are very proactive where we actually go out and target and look for different types of violations. We know certain things happen in certain parts of the community. So there's like Sunnyside may have a particular thing that's more prevalent than uh, U Heights or Green Law. Southside may have something different, but it's prevalent in this neighborhood. And so we kind of have, have learned over the years what we're looking for and what what we can, and we're able to spot it a lot better. Um, once we do that, then we we try to make direct contact with the property owners or the residents. Instead of going in and telling them how bad they are, we ask them, did you know there's a violation? And then we explain why, and we explain, we show them, you know, with the code, why it is an actual violation. We try to get them to understand that. And once they understand it, now we say, OK, what can we do to help you make sure we get this into compliance? And that has worked like a charm for me over the years, because instead of me coming in saying, yeah, you're bad, you better have this fixed in, in two days or else. I'm that or else guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm that guy that when someone comes to me like that, I say, oh, or else. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> you know? And so I try not to be that way. And, and it's been successful for me. So that's part of how we initiate cases. And again, we are very, very proactive. Um, as I'm sure you all have seen some of our reports over time where, you know, we have calls that are staff initiated or citizen initiated. And our staff initiated calls are far more than complaints that we actually field and go out because we're actually out there looking for things to try to keep the community in order. Very difficult, very, very difficult. But once we find it, you know, we try to make direct contact. Um, I have a policy with my staff before a letter is sent to any resident. How many times did you try to make did you make an attempt to talk to them directly? And I have a standing policy that no violation uh, notice is sent until I'm comfortable that you tried to make direct contact. And because the, if you do it enough, you might have to go at different times of the day. Even if you can't make direct contact, check with a neighbor. A neighbor may know when they're around. They can provide them your card, that type of thing. Then they'll call you. And then we can kind of go through it as opposed to just sending I call them nasty grams. <laughs> so <laughs> letters that just all of a sudden um, people are getting. And once they see that emblem from the city, they're like this anyway. Oh, I don't want it. And they'll throw it away. And so then it's that much more difficult to get them to respond to us. And so that's a standard policy of mine. And so, you know, if you all ever call me and say, hey, I've got this violation I'd like you to take a look at. I believe it's a violation. I probably say, yeah, you're probably right, but let me go take a look or I'll have one of my one of my staff take a look. Once we do that, then we can we can start progressing through our process. I don't like to punish or fine people. Um, we do have the ability, but as long as people are communicating with us, with me, actively trying to fix the problem, then I'm never going to have to find them or, or take them to court. If they basically say, go pound sand, unfortunately, I'm not going to pound sand and <laughs> you will still end up doing this because here's, here's what will happen. And once I start giving them the types of figures, the, the cost that it mm -hmm. will, will, uh, they will have to bear if we take it that route, they usually say, oh, okay. One of the things I do a lot of times when I'm trying to get someone to comply, instead of me going in saying, I need you to have this done by Thursday of next week, there's always circumstances. People may not be able to do it. And I'm sure you all know, you want them to own it. If I tell them to do it, it's easy for them to say, oh, I, I couldn't get it done. 
But if they own it and they tell me, oh, I think I can have it done by next Thursday. OK, real cool. If you get it done before that, just give me a call. Let me know if for some reason you can't get it done by Thursday. Just give me a call and say, hey, Reg, I'm sorry. I, you know, I've been busy. I had to work overtime. I've, you know, my daughter was sick, whatever. And we'll we'll work with you. And so that's one of the things and the approaches that myself and my staff take. I do take a lot of heat at times from my bosses, the community <laughs> sometimes, because sometimes people think, well, you're not doing it fast enough. And, and I, I readily accept that. And, you know, because I know that even some of those times where, okay, go a little heavy handed. Well, now it takes, makes it take that much longer because now people stop pushing back. And so I'd rather continue to work with them, give them as much assistance as I can within reason. I mean, I can't let things go indefinitely, but if we can kind of come up with a time frame of when they think it can be done, as long as they communicate, then, then we're good. And so. And when you mentioned it, but when you go into a particular complaint, you look at the entire block. Yes. Yes. I think. Yes. It is applied. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. So when we, if we find a violation, whatever neighborhood we're in, I, I could go up one street and be on that street all day, you know, you know, because even though they may not be very flagrant, there's a lot of different types of violations. And if we really look hard enough, we could probably spot many just in one area, in one neighborhood, one street. You know, and so we try to be cognizant of that. If it's something that's um, life and safety issue or a very uh, health hazard or a fire hazard, and sometimes we have to be careful what we deem a fire hazard as well. But once we know that it is actually a health and safety issue, those are priority. So we don't give as much time. I don't work. Sometimes if it's something, for example, there was a uh, trailer one day that had a lot of sheet metal on the trailer. The trailer was partially out of the uh, driveway over the sidewalk, had very sharp edges on it. That's something that some child or even a person is walking by, they cut themselves on it. So that's something we have to get removed and moved right away. And so there are times where we even offer our muscle <laughs> to, to help get something done. Um, so that's kind of part of the way we initiate and start working cases. Um, it is a process. If it ever does go to the point where we're not getting compliance voluntarily, and that's I always look for voluntary compliance. Um, if we have to force in compliance, that means notices of violation, court, you know, appearances, things like that, which slow, obviously slow that process down as well. But we do have that ability if we have to. I try to avoid that best I can because I don't like court and I think it's a waste of time, a waste of our time. I'd rather be out in the field working with the community as opposed to sitting in court waiting for that case to come up. So um, that's just an overview of how we do it. Um, I'm really proud of the program. I'm proud of the staff we have. They do a great job. Um, I've got a co-compliance officer one, a co-compliance officer two, and a dark sky specialist. So our code compliance officer two is the more experienced. So I throw things at them all the time. <laughs> you know, our doc sky specialist is very good. They, she deals with all the lighting issues here in the city as well as the county. So she's the only one. So it's a big area. We've got a lot of lighting violations, but we've done made great progress over the last couple of years when we've truly hit it, hit it real hard. So. Reggie, with yes. this, if we could get the city council to pass this code compliance, would that enable you to hire more people? Um, Hopefully, possibly. <laughs> you know, in the in the long term, I would hope so. Yeah. I mean, I would love to have a staff of ten. Yeah, but as the city grows, but as the city grows, yeah. yes, I could see and envision that we'll need more help, and that's something that over over time I think can happen. Um, especially the more knowledgeable the staff gets, 
the way they're able to initiate cases, the ones that they spot on their own. And so we have we have a very large caseload. Yes. Um, and so could we use more? Absolutely. Do I hope we can hire more in the future? Yes, I do. And then do my other question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jump in. Reggie kind of looked at me. So we do have a process to ask for new staff. So it's okay. part of our okay. annual budget process. All right. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's great is really, I mean, we don't hear this very often, but if the community comes forward and says, hey, we've adopted this property care ordinance, we'd love to see more resources on this, right? If the community comes forward and says, we'd love to see another code officer, that would help those kind of requests, but we can do that internally. So basically, yeah. Myself and Reggie and our team, we would put in a request for uh, a new position mm -hmm. and they all get considered as a group. The budget team looks at all the requests right. for the entire organization and makes a decision on what can be funded. So it's kind of a holistic approach. So I started interrupting. I no, just wanted, before you we got for, off that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. He, saw me, he saw me he, give him the eye. <laughs> <laughs> my, my other question was, do you work with other community um, organizations if when you go out you give people resources and and you're knowledgeable on those resources who could help i i can't say how knowledgeable i am but i i know how to go and find things you know how to go so i do have okay. some knowledge like of, youth groups and yes maybe through and, and we we utilize all the resources as we can and and when someone has one that they can share with us we're, we're very open for it. But we do, we form relationships within the community with with individual citizens, with groups, with uh, the county. So we, we do have a lot of resources that we reach out to. One of the things that's been my strong suit is, you know, we've kind of, I know for, for a period of time, it seemed like everybody was kind of siloed where, you know, everyone was just doing their thing. And, and yet I feel like, you know, being an athlete, I've, been in team sports all my life. I know everyone has a role. And so mm -hmm. you have to find all of those right. people as a team. We call it team Flagstaff. That's not just the city the internal workers, that's the community. Right. Team okay. Flagstaff. And so we do try to target and earmark those other resources that we can send someone to in order to get something done. Just quickly, the reason I was asking is because um, this summer, we've had two groups come through. Uh, Bike and Build came from Colorado. And they ride their, they are cyclists from Colorado. They rode their bikes to Flagstaff and worked with um, housing. But then we have another group that came through from back east and they were here for a weekend and they were getting ready. They were getting rid of invasive weeds mm -hmm. up by Buffalo Park and, and things of that nature. And so there are groups that travel to areas as well. And that would, I think, be a good resource to find out about. We've used AmeriCorps groups and people okay. like that, people from yeah. out of state that are coming into Arizona and want to, you know, and they'll go to different yeah. communities and they've reached out to us at times and we've utilized them, especially for things like that cleanups or mm -hmm. media and cleanups, those types of things. Um, and so, yeah, we, we're open to any suggestion of a resource that can benefit this community. Okay, I'll give, I'll send you that one information okay. Um, okay. because we housed them over the weekend at the church. All right. Okay. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So Reggie, yeah. I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, with a Lone Tree Overpass project, will that um, maybe be the reason that you guys hire additional people because that will also impact your team as well because it'll be more to look at more to watch more to do and that's you know so i guess i would uh, question the timing on that one to two years two or three years i mean i i don't know yeah dan would be able to answer that more uh but as far as the impact um again being a small staff we all do a lot mm -hmm. and and if we find there's additional projects that are being approved and being worked on and we're finding ourselves not able to keep up, then that's something we would even request. Hey, we, we could use, we de desperately need some more help. And then we go through that process in order to try to do it. Everything that we do like that, the budget team or council would have to recruit. And so my biggest challenge on the South Side neighborhood, because, you know, I'm a commercial property owner, um, is the, um, 
the Rio, the flag, uh, constantly being littered with blankets and garbage and you know food and thermoses and just people throw them in. Then we have the water that comes through that starts carrying them through yeah. the back of my property. So. And, and I know in spring there's usually some coordinated cleanups of the Rio. Um, but with so many people coming through, so many transients and homeless, mm -hmm. it just just keeps adding up, mm -hmm. and it's it's very difficult to keep up with. Well, right now in, in my um, in the backyard, um, there's blankets and bedrolls and stuff right in back, um, and you know I try to keep up. I mean, I even yeah, do and, some weed eating and stuff just to so it yeah. it doesn't get clogged. And 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 happens. feel free when that happens, because again. I'm not personally, I'm not out in the field all day, every day, like I used to be, mm -hmm. but I do have staff out. But sometimes there's going to be areas that we miss. So maybe I can make sure after tonight I put it more on their radar okay. so that because there's times we get right down in there ourselves and pull stuff out during our trail and take it to the landfill. If we have a cleanup, if we have community service workers, which we utilize a ton, mm -hmm. you know, and we use people like that. We uh, we do try to weed whack and trim bushes and things like that on occasion. Uh, technically, it's not our job, but we do it because it needs to be done. And so if you see something and and I know you've done great doing yeah, it yourself. I email you. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, and I apologize. For the, I just saw the one that you just recently sent me. I just saw it today. Yeah, if I need to so, reach out to somebody else, it's okay. I was going to tell you, I was going to actually tell you, you probably you should reach out to Amy Hagen or Scott Overton. I was going to, oh, you can yes. write it down now that you're here. I was going to write it down um, for you. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a couple of issues over there that we're going to be discussing. Yeah. That's Amy. At some point, Amy Hagen, H A G I N. Okay. She's the parks, one of the parks managers. Yeah, because the pine trees are now like all over my. I, I saw it when I was. Yeah, over yeah, today. and now um, their roots are going. So over my I can pine. tell you this one thing too: mm -hmm. if if there's a, a tree on an adjacent property, and the branches or leaves come over your property line. Then the imaginary I have the line. You have the right to yeah. trim them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always say try to talk to the owner of that property first to mm -hmm. encourage them. But if they basically don't, because even if it's a city property and we don't, uh, you know, our, our parks and street staff don't have the bodies to be able to do right. something right away, you do have the right to go up there. So it's not on your building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have you established your property line definitively? That would need to be established. That, that's going to have to be a survey, which is yeah. something that I need to do. It's just I've been. He just mentioned that earlier. Yeah, yeah. I've been. Because sometimes we can't tell in our mapping system on, on GIS, our mm -hmm. mapping system isn't 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I've seen many times where our GIS mapping system will have it pushed so far away, you know it's not that. Mm -hmm. you know, where it's in the middle of a property. Right. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, no, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the only way to know, and the city doesn't actually go out and do the survey themselves, yeah, unless it's their the property idea. that yeah. they are trying to find out. Mm -hmm. um, but I always tell, tell property owners, if, if you really, really want to know and need to know, that's the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. So, okay. But we might have an idea as far as, you know, I'm sure they'll be able to look at it and say, well, well that trees are on our property, not hers. And mm -hmm. they may but go either way, you have a chance, opportunity yeah. to cut them because they're either right. yours or theirs, right. but they're still on yours. I, well, I'm cleaning up pine needles <laughs> now in my yard, and I'm like, okay, that, that's not my tree. <laughs> All right, I do have a uh, question or comment from one of our online folks. Okay. been very patient. Thank you. Uh, Valeria has joined us. Do you want to introduce yourself, Valeria, and then give us your question or comment? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I apologize for my tardiness. I was at a different meeting, meeting that ran over. But I'm Valeria Chase, and um, I I'm the neighborhood liaison between um, the city and the university. Um, and my question is, um, Reggie, does the process that you currently have to identify concerns 
work well? Um, and if you were to dream and have a different reporting system, what would it look like or be? Huh. Right now, everything seems to work as far as um, staff initiating things and the community reaching out with complaints of their concerns. If in a perfect world, you know, yeah, I don't know why you put me on the spot. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm stumped here. Huh? Sorry, Reggie, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Hey, um, no, I, he has time to dream. You know, honestly, really, I mean, I think the the process we currently have for reporting and and initiating and locating um, violations, I think it, it works right now. If we had, I mean, if we had even more residents that, again, if we could train residents to know what actual violations are, that would save some time as well. Because I will say a lot of times we get a call what they are hoping or think is a violation and we go out and it's determined that it's really not. Um, so yeah, I, I would definitely have to give that a little thought because I've never really thought about it because this process has been working for us. Do you have a follow up? Uh, yeah. Um, a little bit, like he, he kind of answered it already, but I was just wondering, you know, like, um, like if a lot more residents started to call and to to you know if the property care ordinance gets uh, passed and other residents want to be able to like help <laughs> or uh, initiate those uh, reports, like how would that be done? Like if you know if if it went that direction, like or do you, what ideas um, you know just off the top of your head come up? So one of the things I have done in the past is I'll take people on ride alongs and kind of bring them through the different neighborhoods and communities, point out things that are actual violations that I spot. Um, always willing to sit down with any resident or any community member to kind of explain some of that. And then I've got papers, you know, the, the codes to show them where I find these and, you know, where they might be able to find them online. Um, but yeah, I think I think even if we would have maybe somewhere in the future have some workshops where we get a group of, you know, group of community members come in, sit down and we have a little training session on what some of the violations, some of the most frequent, because again, some of their neighborhoods, there's things that are more prevalent than others. And so I'd be more than happy to do something like that. I, I think the more that the community knows, the, the better. Because then we can, again, it won't be a waste of their time or mine by, you know, calling me with with a concern, but it's actually not a, a, a violation. I take all concerns, but everything isn't a violation. And so I'd be more than happy to either myself or, or one of my staff be able to maybe hold a periodic workshop. That's something That's maybe great. we can kind of talk about. And, and start planning to do something like that. I, I'd be more than happy to do that. Thanks, Reggie. The neighborhood planning thing. <laughs> 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 uh -huh. I might volunteer um, yeah, to yeah. help you guys. Yeah. You're not so bad. Yeah, and, and again, <laughs> we're, 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 I'm always open for suggestions. I'm not perfect. You know, I, I, I love my job. I think I do a good job at it but I'm not perfect and I'm always open for recommendations to make it better and how we can, you know, be better. Cause again, we're supposed to work together as a community. So um, I'm, I'm very big on that. So that's unless there are more questions for me, that's the story. That's it. I got one. <laughs> So if this tree, okay, we established that the property, the tree is not on the property and you keep getting, roots in your drainage and it keeps clogging it up. What kind of protocol do we have to go through to make to determine hey, this tree needs to go? 
Yeah, I mean, you could, you could, I mean, if if you've had plumbing bills, that type of thing, and yeah. they can show that it was caused by a roof that's on your property. Uh -huh. um, um, but those are types of things that would go through an administrative portion. So that would be, you know, streets or parks because that's the, the city property. And I'm quite sure they don't want to um, keep having you have to pay for something that's caused by something on their property. Okay. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I, I, I again, um, before all of that happens, I would try to, I would have you get together with Scott Overton or Amy Hagan and just discuss and let them know what's been taking place sure. and sure. see what they, what solutions they may come up with. Okay. It's the tree thing. That would be it's yeah, a tree thing. It's a tree thing. <laughs> I, 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 we yeah. love trees, but not close yeah. to buildings, yeah, right? Because right. I, I can say this That's too. In, in the past, on occasions where something was causing a problem, it was actually in the city right away, but the city didn't have the bodies or the time or the resources to remove it. And one of the property owners said, "Look, if I pay for it, well, is it okay for me to remove it?" And they basically said, okay. <laughs> without, without a permit. Yeah. yeah. It, but there, there was the permission. The permission. Yeah. 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 Need permission. If it's a dead tree, then yeah. we use our wild, um, what's it called? Uh, Firewise mm -hmm. persons, like dead trees. And then they can they can force. So, so they, you know, recommend the removal of something before it actually falls. Oh, yeah. But if it's a live tree, then there's some consideration as to what to do. But if it's if you can show and be, and, and a plumber says, yeah, man, I've had to come and you know clear the roots out time and time again. This is ridiculous because they keep backing up. Mm -hmm. It's costing you money. Definitely. And happy. you can you can present that to them. Say, hey, uh, you need to help us figure something. That's, that's a live tree. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's got pine needles coming out of it and roots oh, coming out of yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of saw it on my way. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's they're, they're, very <laughs> they're very live. They're very live. So thank you. Anyway, appreciate it. All right. Is that it, Reggie? That's it. All right. Thank you. All right, thanks. You know, I have to echo what Reggie said. Uh, I'm I'm proud of this program. I've learned so much about code compliance from Reggie. Um, I'm proud to say I hired Reggie as our code compliance. <laughs> Yes, not, he was on our staff as a as a code compliance officer. Um, but I've seen all the various places I've worked. I've seen the different approaches to code compliance. You know, the last place I worked before Flagstaff, they actually wore uniforms like police officers. And and the one officer, he he actually carried a sidearm. He he wanted to carry a, a gun. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but I think when that person shows up at the door, right, in a uniform and all that, you think it's law enforcement. But what they do is not law enforcement. It's so different, right? Um, and so I think Reg's approach about getting to know our community, getting to know our property owners, understanding the situation, working with them to get the best resolution, not using resources on things that don't get us any further along and being punitive. I really believe that's the right approach, right? There is a time to be more aggressive and I think we're appropriately aggressive. So. You know, I've probably given them a hard time. I'd like to think less than five, maybe. <laughs> a couple. Maybe less than five. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so thanks everybody for listening and uh, being part of this. Really, the next thing on our agenda is next steps. And so, you know, this is the last of our six meetings. We've got this draft um, purpose, intent, and property care standards. You know, if this group feels ready, the next step is to go to a city council work session, right? And turn this into an ordinance. Get feedback from city council. Hopefully everybody who's participated will come that night, participate in the discussion. Tell us what you like about it. Tell us where you think we haven't gone far enough. Um, that's the starting of kind of the adoption process, right? And so I think my sense is our work here is done, but I just want to make sure everybody's here. I know we've got folks who participated who aren't here tonight, but. You know, does everybody feel like this is ready to go to the next step, which is a council work session? Anybody, Anybody online? Not? If you raise a hand, oh. No hands raised. All right. Hold on. I'm Dude. sorry. Excuse oh. me. <laughs> I, I couldn't raise my hand. 
fast enough. <laughs> um, uh, it had been mentioned before, I think it was Michelle who had brought it up, the idea of potentially passing it for, you know, like, or requesting for it to be like a pilot run um, before we um, permanently adopt it. Um, is that being considered or is that just, um, has that been dropped? Yeah, I mean, you don't really do pilot ordinances. You know, sometimes we do pilot programs. So if one of the outcomes was we want to create a team that focuses on, you know, conditions of buildings and trying to help folks get their houses, you know, repaired and painted or solid waste issues. You know, we've talked about creating a program out of this. You know, I could see a pilot program, but typically an ordinance you adopt it and you you go from there and you see how it's how it's working. Um, so I'm not quite sure how we would do a pilot um, I adoption of the rules. It's like a sunset and a renewal. Yeah. I mean, we could add a sunset date to it. So we've not done that in Flagstaff, but sometimes you sometimes communities decide, well, we only need this for a couple of years. So you tie a sunset date to a, a ordinance. But I hear what you're saying, Valeria. I think it was about maybe a pilot program. OK, yeah, whatever works. Um, I was just um, curious if that had been considered. Yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, Laura also has a go ahead, Laura. Um, yes, I think that this needs to be a permanent program because um, people come and go out of Flagstaff so you know, not everybody will know about it and respect it. So I think that it needs to be implemented as a program that, you know, sticks around. Thank you for that comment. Duffy? I think it would be worth doing a lot of public education. Um, send it out with the water bills for the non-resident property owners or something mm -hmm. like that. In the city newsletter thing, if you're still putting that out. Uh, displays at the libraries, whatever, just to make sure people know what it says so they don't think the worst case scenario and then get all defensive. You're talking about in preparation for like adoption, getting some community. Well, once it's adopted, let people know what was adopted yeah. proactively yeah. so that people don't say, oh, here they go again. Yeah. Because <laughs> we've been through this before and yeah. people got quite upset. Um, but. It's just common sense stuff, really. And then doesn't the newspaper constantly um, call it? They're just constantly looking at the city website and everything for. Because I know that I, we, I, would I can't remember what I want to call it. I would make sure you you write this like we stuff. do press releases. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So maybe they would pick it up. Yeah. No, I've been yeah. working with our communications and, team. We've done some. Twitter yeah. things for these meetings. Yeah, but yeah, we can do some press releases on the property care ordinance and uh, kind of an upcoming work session. We get that date settled. Yeah. Set. What's Twitter? Don't use only social media, please. <laughs> I don't do any social media. Yeah, I don't either. But so you'll miss yeah. a lot of people yeah. who would want to know. I mean, you can use we it, won't but don't it. use it right. that. Slowly. No, it's not exclusive. It's it not also exclusive. goes on Facebook. <laughs> no, we also we do our website. We have our city website, and uh, yeah, but even the websites, older people aren't on websites. They're not on Facebook necessarily. They're not doing Twitter. They need to see it in print. It needs to come with their water bill, or you know something. Paper. It needs to go. You need to reach out to people the way that they communicate in the world. I hear That's what you're saying. I do. We do sometimes tack things onto the water bill. You can have, um, they'll print certain messages, right? That don't yeah. cost us anything. We don't see that, <laughs> but we would see an insert. All right. You know what I mean? I, yeah, I, I do. don't know how they do that anymore. I'm I used not to, sure we if used they to do, do that, that at yeah. NACOG. Stick it in the Southwest gas bill or something, but. That's an insert in our water bill. No, I mean, they still do them, but I just don't know what the process the water is bill anymore. Say, yeah. It's a postcard, isn't it? My wife pays the bills. No. It shows that I don't even know. I guess it is in an envelope. It's, it's in an envelope. envelope. It's an envelope. Yeah. Oh. But thank you. We'll look at yeah, how do we do outreach to people who are outreach. using computers and mobile phones? Even computers are kind of 
sounds about the phone. You just go door to door and hand it out. No, I know we did. I mean, mailings are very expensive, right? And they're not, frankly, they're not very effective anymore. I know some people that open their mail and read it. Yeah. But um, like when we have do required mailings for like a zoning code, when they adopted the 2011 code, it had to go to every property in the city. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that mail. It's not cheap. Yeah. One of the things we try to do sometimes is get with the group, neighborhood groups mm -hmm. and so that, that they know their neighborhood and they can help spread the word and provide the information for them. That's one of the ways that we have discussed in the past. And then that would tie into your training mm -hmm. as well. Right. And then they have a face. Right. And yeah. it's more community. We have an interested parties list, which is really more about land use and that so people you may be on that list that you get all the notices for public hearings on land use items. I you know, know that they're going to get guy. Charlie, maybe get some. <laughs> yeah. Laura, did you want to ask them again? Yes, I just wanted to agree with Duffy. I believe that many people don't use all the new technology in a lot of our older neighborhoods where we do have neighborhood associations. They don't use a computer or anything like that. So we need to be proactive and get it out in many different forms. Thanks. I'm going to make a note here about notifications. But everybody in town reads the paper. Really? Not that yes, <laughs> really. Legal ads? Everybody in town that I know reads the paper. People read the legal ads in the paper? That's for you know, I read it electronically on a computer, though. I'm sorry. I I beg forgiveness. But, but do you read, read the legal ads or the adverts? Just the article. Oh, the legal schmegal stuff. That's you do you read, read it? Yeah, I do. <laughs> that's like all the ads go for here. It's just a legal ad, right? And it goes into the legal ad. And they're yeah. very expensive. Very yeah. expensive. All right. Anything else for the good of the group? I think we've agreed next steps. Once I get a, a work session confirmed, I'll send it out. I've got this mailing list. You're all on it, I believe. If you've signed in, we'll add you if you weren't on it before. Anything else for the good of the group from uh, Teams Land or here in the room? I am not seeing anybody. But... All right. Well, it's only it's twelve after six. We've got the room till seven. <laughs> <laughs> are we ready to call this? I think we are. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Have a great night. Thank, Thank you. you. That's for next If you didn't know, I'm a jokester all the time. I like, I like.